And now we're joined by Josh Pate. You can find him over at Late Kick with Josh Pate on YouTube. You can find it on uh, anywhere where your podcasts are found. If you're a college football fan, you probably recognize this face. Uh, Josh, thanks for coming on the show. What is all this? This is a beautiful setup you have here. Walk me through all of it if you have a spare hour. (laughs) <laughs> all right so there's there are a few things here so this is obviously an oregon helmet you can't yep. see the jaguars helmet that's signed by a bunch of my former teammates guy that's like my little brother here uh his name is pharaoh brown he plays for the uh yep. new england patriots right now a couple shoes that i like and then some uh some uh cards because I, I i collect cards so i have uh few few of my favorites up there some bowl rings some books things that you know are you know very relevant to me mm, matt well same here because what we have here is we have blinds <laughs> that's it that's it around this time of year that's all i need in my life i just need blinds and i need people to be shut off from uh from the inside world we have here yeah and uh i i, I see that uh things are changing in your in your life because uh, one of the posts that you have pinned to your Twitter account is ba- basically your uh, seven buck story. That yeah. and the seven buck story is the is the rock story where he went from nothing to this. I'm taking off air and making three hundred bucks a week. It worked out because I didn't give up. That sounds like motivational speaker talk. You know, it sounds like something your guidance counselor tells you. No, I promise you guys, it works. And I noticed that you post that a lot of people don't necessarily always want to talk about that journey and how bad it was and everything like that. What led you to sharing that part of the story? Well, because I think it's really relevant. I think um, I I don't know. I mean, so the way I look at it, George, is if you're blessed to have a platform, if you're blessed to, you know, live out your dream scenario, which I get to do with my job. But it wasn't always that good. Why would you keep that story to yourself? If you know a lot of people could potentially benefit from it, why would you keep it to yourself? So, um, you know, when I I always told myself, when I get to the level where anyone could hear my voice, I was going to let that story be known. And I don't necessarily tell it every day, but I've done it a couple of times on the show. And what you're talking about is on my Twitter profile where I just pinned it. And it's what are we we're exiting 2023. We're going into 2024 as recently as 2019, <clears throat> at least financially. It was a really tough time. And I was down in Columbus, Georgia, doing local stuff. And that was right before I got the call that I didn't know was coming from from CBS and 24-7. But the reason I put it out there is because I think there are a lot of folks who who have the requisite talent level. They have desire. They're working hard and they just feel like their their wheels are spinning. And it may be the best thing in the world for you because it was the best thing in the world for me that I didn't get a break for a long time. Because you may only get one big break. And if it comes too early, you may not be equipped to to handle it the right way. Uh, but also, I put it out there to let folks know that just because you can't see over the horizon and, and it looks bleak doesn't mean there may not be something right over the horizon. I, it's a message I could have used at that point. So I put it out there so anyone else who could use it could have it. Yeah, and that's something I've noticed from people who have had success and something I noticed in my own life, the difference between – I would say you, me, who, whoever else, people who have had success in life. It's just that like some sometimes there are some genius level people, you know, what I mean? but for the most part, the people just won't quit. Like They just yeah. won't quit. They just keep getting better and better and better. Um, but do you believe being a I guess, would you still consider yourself an independent creator for the college football stuff or are you semi, you know, like semi independent? I would consider the spirit of my content independent because I really haven't changed much about that or the approach. I guess I've got the overlap of best of both worlds where I've got the backing of CBS. I'm employed by CBS. I get the resources of CBS and and we provide a big return for them on that investment. But one of the biggest trade offs is at every turn, I got to give them credit at every turn. They fulfilled their promise to me. And that promise was we're not going to interfere. Obviously, the creative process works. We just want you to do it for us. And there's never been a single time in my four years now here, there's never been a single time where any kind of managerial or executive type has stepped in and said, all right, we're going to need concessions from you. Now you got to do it this way. So I think if you were to stumble on late kick and you didn't know any better, the production level is really high. So it's obvious there's some money behind it. But I don't think if you listen to the podcast and didn't watch the visual, 
I don't think you'd even pick up on the fact that it's anything more than the same product we were presenting yeah. when I was. Independent. See, I would agree with that. And so do you think that independent creators are the, the future of college football or just sports in general? Because there are more shows like mine, like yours, like uh, popping up on the Internet and people are watching and people are paying attention to it. And I and it seems like people are kind of shying away from the the like the hot take machine as much uh, wholeheartedly. So I think that there is a format and there's a style that people have come to crave. And it was born out of the hot take generation for a, for a generation of time, for a five to 10 year period, as we define generation in media that worked uh, the, the clickbait generation, the aggregation and engagement farming generation. Uh, that, that was something you had to go through to get to this part here. But now you'll notice there are still some hot take type formats out there. But the ones that are at scale were already at scale five years ago. No yeah. one has scaled a hot take platform, whether it be independently or corporately in the past five years, because the interest has waned and the appeal has waned. And if you don't already have your audience baked in, you're not getting new audience that way. And I think the rise of digital media and, and the YouTubes of the world where anyone and everyone with an Internet connection theoretically could put their stuff out there is there was more variety in content. And I think the content got smarter and a lot of people, maybe even myself included, who used to find themselves watching one form of content realized there's something better out there for me yep. to each his and her own. But maybe for me, there's something better out there for me. And in a weird way, George, um, I think the COVID year, as terrible as that was for 15 other reasons, strictly if you zoom it into our lane, it started to filter out who was who and what was what yep. because you had some folks in that period of time that realized everything else in the world sucks if i claim to be a college football guy i'm just going to talk about college football and there were other people who chose to deviate from that college football lane or major league baseball or nfl or whatever you cover and a very big portion of the audience figured out this person doesn't seem nearly as passionate about what they <laughs> be passionate about as I thought they were. I'm going to go over here to this dude who's just yeah. who's sticking to his content and sticking to what he knows best, even in the most trying of times. We saw our audience scale really rapidly during that 2020 year, which was ironic because we didn't even know if we were going to get college football or any sports that year. Yeah. But I think what it did is it, it allowed an endearance of a new portion of audience to products and people and whatnot that they found to be authentic. Yeah. Um, now let's get to the games this weekend because you were out at the Rose Bowl. I'm out here in L.A. and there was a lot of talk about, I guess, the the Florida State situation because and they wanted to look at the result. Oh, Alabama, and Michigan, they went to the they went to overtime. That means that the committee got it right. So does the result of a 27 20 game, does that justify what the committee did in leaving Florida State out? I don't think it it justifies them being wrong or right. And you could have gotten a 47 to 20 final and I wouldn't have cared. Yeah. I put it to you this way. This is the way I tried to explain it. So if I bring George in and I bring you to my place of business, uh, uh, Pate State Enterprises over here and we're hiring a new executive level director and you fit the qualifications as I see it and your resume checks out and your references check out. If, if you check those boxes, I'm going to hire you. Now, if you go and blow someone's car in the parking lot up three weeks onto the job, <laughs> and someone, someone walks into my office and says, see, that's evidence you shouldn't have hired him. I would tell him, get out of my office. I'd probably fire them because what they're saying is dumb. I didn't have the foresight to know what you were going to do when I hired yes. you. All I have to go on is the information at hand. And I try and make the best decision I can. So the point is, the resume as it relates to you making the playoff or the resume as it relates to them placing you in a bowl pecking order is your regular season record. And if you're in a conference championship game, yeah. that is baked into it. Okay. That's it. So if you didn't think Florida state belonged, nothing about two days ago should have changed your mind. And if you think Florida state did belong, it shouldn't have mattered if Bama Correct. won by 50. It shouldn't Correct. have changed your mind. It, it is what it is regardless. I totally agree with that. And we ended up with no SEC team in the final. And it was funny because 
I was like, where is the math here, people? Because so many people, because I'm a message board troller. Like, I, I don't comment on it, but I go in there and read and see what people say, look at it on Twitter. And they were like, Georgia was the best team in the country. They should have put Georgia in. And I was like, how? How, Sway? How are they going to put Georgia in? So, but is the, and you, and we've had debates about this, about the college football playoff expanding. But because of name, image, and likeness, and there, there seems to be, a parody coming in the sport. Like, I, I don't think it's going to ever be like NFL type, but with the, the perceived parody that seems to be coming where rosters aren't necessarily as deep. Have you rethought your playoff position and it expanding at this point in time? No, I, I'll, I don't think I'll ever rethink that. I think the first point you started to make is the one I've come to realize probably an area that I was a little, I don't want to say flat out wrong in, but certainly I undersold the concept of was the concept that NIL and the portal was going to even out the talent pool. And while I always think the big boys will have the most talented rosters, I don't think that's going to change. I do think that kind of the top of the canopy has been shaved off a little bit and depth is certainly yep. never look like it used to in the past. I mean, LSU, for example, yesterday, they got a, a five-star freshman, at tackle, who enters the portal, played all 12 games this year and <laughs> enters because he's projected to be the third tackle on their team because they got two that are entrenched as starters. That didn't used to happen. It does now. And so in the aggregate, what you've seen is you've seen the ability for us to have what we have now. We don't have a 12-team format yet. This is still a four-team format. And I've got something happening Monday night in Houston that people told me couldn't happen. And that is a team in Washington with a roster below 50% in yeah, blue chip rating. Yeah, that blue chip rating. All of a sudden, they're playing for a title and could win a title. And I was told that we needed a 12-team playoff to get that. And it turns out maybe the format of the playoff wasn't the key. Maybe dispersing the talent a little bit more was the key. And there are two things happening there. Portal and NIL have a lot to do with it. But also, if you'll notice, I've talked to you about this before on your show. I have always thought the key to evening out the talent pool a little bit more in college football was teams in Florida recruiting their state better because Ohio yeah. state, Alabama, Michigan, or not Ohio state or Michigan, et cetera, but Ohio state, Clemson, Alabama, those teams were raiding Florida, just raiding South Florida. Yep. And now it doesn't even matter if Miami's good on the field yet. They're keeping some of their talent home. Florida is doing that and they're not good yet. Florida state is doing that. And so think about what it means for, five or six more blue chip kids from Florida per cycle, not going to Alabama, not going to Ohio State. It, it doesn't make them eight and four all of a sudden. Yeah. But what it does is, you know, in a key close game, all of a sudden when you think athletes are going to make plays and talent wins a game, you, you don't have that extra five-star receiver in the slot that you used to have. And instead, you know, it's, it, it plays out. It plays out in those moments. It ends up playing out. Yeah, so you end up with uh, Washington versus Michigan. Washington is below the blue chip rating of fifty percent, and but when we've seen other teams, like when we see when we saw TCU play Georgia, that was a total mismatch. When we've seen Cincinnati when they played, I think Alabama mismatch. But this doesn't feel like a mismatch, even though Washington is favored. I mean, um, Michigan's favorite. I like Washington in in the game. Their their trio of uh, Dunze, McMillan, Polk, and then uh, Penix at, at quarterback. I think that that's going to be tough because their defense is not good, but it is. But the part of their defense that's bad, which is their pass defense, is not what Michigan does anyway. Yeah. So a couple of things there. I I agree with everything you said on the front end. So I won't repeat that. But the second part is I don't think a lot of people have watched Washington. Just if they're honest with themselves, they could tell yeah. you Michael Penix. They could tell you the head coach's name. They could tell you Washington throws the ball a lot. They don't know. I, George, I don't think half the country even knows they just won the Joe Moore Award. I, I, <laughs> I don't think they have any concept about how good that offensive line is. But that's okay. I didn't either at one point. I continued to pick against them, but I went and watched them up close in person and, and got a couple of really tough lessons dealt my way and understood – no, it's not a TCU situation because they're not going to get dominated at the line of scrimmage. Nope. It's not going to happen. And so I think the trap that some fell into in this Washington-Texas game 
was looking at talent level and talent rating and the team talent composite. And of course, Texas had the more talented roster. Well, that's, that's not the way a game's played. You don't take two pieces of paper and rub it together, and that's a football game. You have styles, you have matchups, and in some cases, if you have a dominant room, like a wide receiver room in Washington that can take over a game, and you've got a good enough offensive line, and you've got an assassin at quarterback, that's the game. It's, it's over. It doesn't matter that you have three outside linebackers more highly rated than their highest guy. It doesn't matter if you have a free safety that was a number two at his position coming out of high school. If the matchups dictate that they end up dictating the style that the fight's going to be uh, fought in, it's, it's over. And see, I think, see um, I think the difference though, Pate though, is that it, when you look at talent ratings, they're looking off of recruiting rankings where uh, Washington has potentially four first round picks Right. On their team, I think right. that that's the part that's been ignored is that their talent rating is not what the stars were when they came in because they have been developed. And Kalen DeBoer, he's done something that coaches are now telling you that can't be done, which is to uh, work with the homegrown talent. Because when Jimmy Lake got fired, he didn't uh, go on and, and just rehaul the entire roster. He didn't portal kids out and all of that. Like, this is largely kids that he did not bring in, aside from the running back and um, uh, Johnson and Michael Penix Jr. The majority of that roster was already there. So is Kalen DeBoer <laughs> teaching a lesson on how to build a roster, or did he get lucky with just having them wide receivers and tackles and everything else there? So I've talked to a couple of folks who were on the staff before he got there at Washington, a couple of folks who were responsible for recruiting a lot of those offensive linemen, for example. And sure enough, they tell you, when we brought those guys in, we thought they had potential to be studs, but they weren't going to be that as freshmen, and they probably weren't going to be that in their second year. So they always projected them as multi-year down the road guys. But it's a let me turn my phone off. But what you just said, so that's a really good point because it goes back to what I've thought about a lot. If you're trying to run a database model, for example, and you really care about talent level, you have to value recruiting rankings. But what you would be foolish to do is continue to value the recruiting ranking two, three, four years into a guy's career. Because mm -hmm. by then, if you're any good at what you do, it doesn't matter what he was as a 17 year old anymore. If he's 20 or 21 years old, you've watched him play college football. You should have your own unique talent rating on him as a college football player. And so, you know, if you've, if you've got your data model here, your recruiting value should go down over time and your college eval should go up over time. And that's what should define you as a player. That's certainly how, you know, an NFL draft scout would look at you. I think a lot of folks either don't pay attention to Washington or they've been too lazy to do that or they don't trust themselves to evaluate talent, which knowing half these folks is probably a proper way to go through life. And so they're still counting on the fact that these were a bunch of three stars out of high school. Yeah, but they're 22 years old as well. So, so they're not three-star 17-year-olds oh, anymore. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a good point. Um, I got one more for you before we get to right or wrong real quick. Uh, bowl season featured a lot of opt-outs, right? You had the Florida State-Georgia game. You've had, you know, other games that just haven't been competitive. How do you think that, that we fix bowl season? And bowl season and the bowls already give out gifts to players. Why not pay them – to play well i think you and i talked about this three years ago i mean that's always been pretty common sense to me yeah. um and it's now now that now that it's biting advertisers in the pocket i think we're going to see something along those lines happen to where either you've got to enable a revenue sharing distribution system from the bowl payout or you got to do something even more radical like move bowl games to week one of the following year but Sheesh. It, it, yeah if you don't if you think that's radical allow me to present the alternative. The alternative is keep what you got now and allow it to erode even further. At this point, it's untenable. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So you have to do something else. I didn't, I didn't even consider the uh, putting the uh, bowl season in, in the first week. That might be a great idea. But uh, now I want to get to right or wrong, Pate. Th this is five quick questions um, that you can answer and, you know, and give me a quick one. Um, so there will right or wrong, there will never be another Nick Saban 
including Nick Saban, because now he's gone three years without a championship, which is the longest run since he's been at Alabama. Oh, that's 100 percent right. I mean, if Nick Saban were to reemerge today and had to go based on the the here and in the future model of college football, I don't think anyone's doing that. You can't stack a roster like that. Uh, you're going to have probably more competitive balance and just randomization when it comes to injury and stuff because you got to play more games. So I, I think that's absolutely right. All right, next question. Um, Jim Harbaugh will coach where next season? I think he's going to be in the NFL, but everything's just kind of everyone's kind of assuming that. And I am too. I'm reading tea leaves. I certainly haven't had anyone at Michigan say, hey, psst, this is happening. So, yeah. I mean, I just, I feel like the organization and the fan base has always looked at this year as the year we got to get it done. And then whatever's over the cliff, we'll handle that when it, when it comes time. Um, next one. Reggie Bush is the greatest college football player of all time. Oh, man. Um yeah, I had a guy at Auburn that was pretty good in 2010. Do, do I need to go multi years or can we just have like a, a moment in time? Like yeah, Cam mo moment in time. I think I'd go, I may go Cam Newton. I may go with a guy who, who played the most important position and, and put the team on his back. But I remember Reggie Bush and I remember watching that. And I remember, yeah. I remember like, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if USC was playing Fresno. If you knew they were coming on at 1030 at night. You were I'm watching, in, boy. I'm living in Georgia at the time. I say, hey, hey, where are y'all watching Reggie? Where are y'all watching USC tonight? What? This is Harris County, Georgia. It's going to be 10 o'clock before they come on. It don't matter. Yeah, Reggie's on. Where are we watching Reggie tonight? Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And, and by, the, by, by the way, Dwyer was down. Um, <laughs> and um, Blank is most responsible for the disintegration of the Pac-12. Larry Scott. Yep. I call him Larry Michael Scott because he ran it yeah, like oh, wow. Dunder, Dunder Mifflin paper. <laughs> wow. I, 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 what, what would happen? Let's just, I know it's a fool's errand now, but what happens if we, if we put a different decision maker in his seat seven or eight years oh ago? Oh, my God. Or even, George, even as recently as like two or three years ago, what if they just outmaneuvered the Big 12 and nothing yeah. else than that? They'd still be afloat. And the, the thing I'm thinking right now is I know everyone's talking big two, SEC, Big Ten. But to me, it's about buying yourself time to stay alive Yep. because you never know what could be coming. Like you, you as long as you're at the table, you never know when the kitchen door may open and something comes through and gets put on the table. None of you could have ever expected and you can't reap it unless you're at the table. Yep. Yep. Uh, um, last one. The biggest lie in college football is. Uh, you are what your record says you are, and that'll be proven even more of a lie in the coming years when you have a disproportionately strong Big Ten and SEC, just strength of schedule wise versus what's going to exist in the ACC or the Big 12 or elsewhere. Um, you know, there, there's going to be I'll give you an example. I don't think Florida is going to be good next year. But let's say Florida was good. Let's say for the sake of argument, they were the 10th best team in the country. George, they're going to play five teams in five weeks at the end of the season that just finished top 10. So yeah. it, there's a world where a legitimate top 10 caliber Florida is a nine and three team. Yep. And there, there's a world where you've got an 11 and one in another conference. Well, is that committee going to have the stones to understand how to interpret strength of schedule? Nope. Or are they going to fall victim <laughs> to, oh, you are what your record says you are? Because if they fall victim to that, I'm going to tell you what I would do. I'd do what Michigan just did. I'd load up on cupcakes as much as I oh. could. And I'd understand that, hey, even if you leave me out of the top four, you're not going to leave me out of the top 12. So I'll just, I'll completely use it as a 12-week preseason. And then I'll go in the playoff on fire and I'll be healthy because I will have rested my starters half the year. So I, you are what your record says you are has always been a lie in college sports, but it's going to be even bigger a lie in the coming years.
Oh, that makes me want to throw up thinking about more more bad schedules. But uh, you yeah. guys, he's Josh Pate. Find him over at Late Kick with Josh Pate on YouTube. Find him on CBS Sports. Find him uh, in, occasionally in a suit now, now that, now that he's a company man. <laughs> Josh, and thanks for coming. And white t-shirt on. After all this, this is what it comes to. <laughs> hey, man, you went, you, you went company. I had to take over the white tee. That's probably the most stinging sentence you've ever thrown my way. It'll take me a couple of weeks to get over that one. (laughs) Thanks for coming on. All right, man. Thank you guys for joining me for the new rebranded Unafraid Show where it's about us. Make sure that you guys leave a comment, tell a friend about it. Most importantly, share and come back next week because we got a surprise for you. Actually, I'm going to tell you right now. Reggie Bush will be in the building and you guys don't want to miss it. So tell a friend, subscribe, get the notifications, everything in between. Catch you next week.